next and last half of this session is the iterated random function pro problem. And the authors are Ritam Baumik, Nilanjan Datta, Avijit Dutta, uh, Niki Muha, and Mahiru Dandi. We noticed that the authors of the previous paper are also here, but this time they were so clever to get more co-authors. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Niki will give the talk. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I'm uh, the only person standing between, between you and the coffee break. Uh, so I'm asking you to just hold on for a little bit and maybe not use the espresso me machine during my presentation, unless of course it's absolutely necessary. Um, so what's this presentation about? Um, let's say, just to start introduction, um, we have a random function. So a function chosen uniformly at random from a particular domain and range. And we also would like to consider an iterated random function. So here we have a random function that we've iterated our times. Now, the question I want to ask ourselves is, so in a black box way, so you can not look inside, these are just objects where you can, look, where you can give inputs and look at the output. How are these two constructions different? Um, now just to give a simple argument of how they are definitely not the same, if you look at the random function, then here you can see with a certain number of uh, distinct inputs what uh, approximately the collision probability will be, so the chance of having uh, two different inputs uh, that lead to the same output. For this iterated random function, the collision probability will be approximately r times higher. So if you want to see this, like, like intuitively you could say, um, I have some inputs, I apply the random function once, if I don't have a collision, I can still try again in the next iteration and see if maybe then I am uh, colliding. So clearly we have a different collision probability for these two constructions, so they are not the same. I mean, some people say, hey, a random function, just applying it a few times is still random. Well, here's clearly an example that it is not. Now, in the previous slide, what I showed is a non-adaptive uh, collision finding attack. So we have a certain number of inputs, in this case, uh, Q inputs. We apply the function, we get the outputs, and then of the outputs, we check if there are two that are identical, so that would indicate a collision. <coughs> now, however, why do we restrict ourselves to this? Um, what about adaptive collision finding attacks? So it could be that there's one output, like in this case y2, that is somehow being used to compute the next input. Um, and then we may also look at the output and see if there's a collision somewhere. Also, why would we restrict ourselves to um, adaptive collision finding attacks? We could look at any type of attack that you could do. Um, so maybe there is, instead of a collision, some type of multi-collision or short cycle or some other type of property that we, we may find. So then, in this setting, uh, the best known attack, so looking at random function or random function has been iterated, the best known attack is this non-adaptive collision finding attack that comes from the first slide. You just choose a set of distinct inputs apply the function and see if there's a collision in the output. But the best known bound, which is a simple application of uh, CVC Mac, um, so takes any <coughs> distinguishing attack into account, gives a result where, as you can see, there is still a gap. So you have a factor R for the best known attack and a factor R squares for the best known bound. So that would indicate that um, Maybe we can find a better attack, or maybe we can prove a better bound to uh, close this gap. So that's something we will look into in this paper, um, and it's something that we can do, although it probably wouldn't be accepted. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, look at the best known, yeah, I stole Gregor's joke from yesterday, it's still working. <laughs> so this is something we will do, we will look at uh, improving the bound. So too bad for people who actually like attacks and would like to find a better attack because that's not something that uh, will be possible. So let's give a bit more about the model that will be used. This is um, very basic, but it's really important to understand what exactly we're doing here. Because when the model is different, of course, the results are different as well. 
So we're looking at an um, adversary that will typically tie to distinguish between two worlds. One is usually called the real world and the other the ideal world. Um, so for any adversary that makes at most Q queries, so you'll be limited in how much of the function you can see, you can only evaluate it on a certain number of inputs. We want to bounce the advantage. So the last line of formula is given for the advantage to um, distinguish between these two worlds. Now, um, important to note is that the framework that we're looking at is an information theoretic framework. So these objects that you have, these random functions, um, they're not deterministic, al uh, deterministic algorithms, but they're statistical <laughs> objects. So this will mean that the output of this object is not known until you've queried it. So in the same sense that um, you don't know what the result is going to be of the dice roll until you actually throw it. Um, this allows us to look at computationally unbounded adversaries because there's no limit in the amount of computation you can do. The statistical randomness is what allows you to, uh, to get a security result. So then uh, the technique that we will use is, um, again as in the last presentation, the H coefficient technique by uh, Padayan. So in this technique, you look at a transcript. What a transcript is, is a Q-tuple of <coughs> input and output pairs to the, out, to the oracle. And important, if you want this, uh, this technique to actually work, is that you partition your transcripts into two different sets which are then typically called, I mean, you have this real world, ideal world, you have good transcripts and bad transcripts. It's a bit of an arbitrary definition, but somehow you have to, to define how you're going to uh, separate your uh, transcripts. And that allows you to uh, apply the technique. Now, um, the real application of the technique comes at the end of the presentation, but I think it can help to get some understanding <coughs> of what the technique actually does with a much simpler example. So perhaps the simplest example where you could apply this um, H coefficient technique to is uh, the random function, random permutation uh, switching lemma, PRP PRF switching lemma. So then what you have is a random function and a random permutation. And you want to see what is your advantage with a certain number of queries to distinguish between, the, between these two. Uh, now, interestingly, this problem is not so trivial, because for example, the first proofs that were given of this uh, switching lemma, the standard proof basically, uh, did contain an error, as uh, Kono pointed out. So this is not to say, uh, because I've, I've heard that some people misunderstand this comment, that some types of techniques to prove uh, security results are better than other techniques. That's not the point here. Um, but it's just to show that it's not trivial to, uh, completely trivial to look into this result. It may be useful to uh, re-evaluate um, this, this uh, type of result with a much more powerful thinking, just to have an understanding of how it works. So for PRP, PRF, um, we could say the random function is the real world and then the random permutation is the ideal world. A natural way to define what good transcripts are is that you could say that a good transcript means that all of the outputs are distinct. So that would mean that you don't see any collisions in there. Then here you see uh, the lemma of the H coefficient technique, where it's important to see that we have this epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 that we would like to compute. And we have, when we have these, um, the advantage is bounded by the sum of both of them. I see we already lost one person. <laughs> okay. Uh, so for the PRP PRF switching lemma, uh, for those interested, when the full slides are online, you'll, you'll see the, the derivation uh, in the backup slides. You have a term epsilon 1 that is non-zero, a term epsilon 2 that is zero, because in the ideal world, there are no bad transcripts. Also, interestingly, we're not actually calculating a collision probability here. We're looking at the probability of having a certain transcript in the real world and a certain transcript in the ideal world. And because the fraction of those is smaller than 1, we have this term epsilon 1 that uh, appears. 
but it's actually quite arbitrary that we choose the ideal world to be random function and uh, um, sorry, real world random function and ideal world random permutation because if you uh, would do it the other way around then you get an alternative <coughs> way of proving the same result using the H coefficient technique but now what happens is that um, the values of epsilon 2 and epsilon 1 get swapped so now epsilon 1 is the zero one and epsilon 2 is the non-zero one now it can happen that in the ideal world which is now the random function we have some bad transcripts, namely transcripts where the outputs are uh, colliding. Okay, so let's get back again to uh, the uh, iterated random function problem, but forget for the slides that follow iteration. So what we're going to do now does not involve any iteration. We're just going to look at random <laughs> functions. What we're interested in is what are all the successful collision attacks that you can do on a random function with one or two trails? So we don't clear what the trail is. Um, what do they look like? So what can we do? Um, we could look at a single trail attack, so like one starting point. And from this starting point, we can continue applying the random function. And then at some moment, it may happen that we enter into a cycle. Okay, at this moment, that's the moment when we have found a collision because there are two distinct inputs that give the same uh, output. Now, what we can do is fix the length of the tail and fix the length of the cycle. So that's not something you would usually do, but that's what helps in the later uh, derivation of the proof. In that case, you can bound the probability of having a collision with these specific parameters. So if your number of queries is smaller than t plus c, then you will have a probability of zero because you haven't made enough queries for this fixed value, this <coughs> fixed pair of t and c to actually find the collision. But as soon as q is larger than uh, or equal to t plus c, then you will have this term that uh, can be used to, to bound. Now we'll actually use a second uh, bound as well, uh, which has some parameter uh, alpha in there, that is some real number. There's also a bound related to T and C uh, involving this alpha. So basically later at some step in the proof, we, can, we will fix this alpha with a specific value that is convenient to, to derive the result. So this is one example. Another thing that can happen is that you have uh, an attack starting with uh, two trails. And in that case, um, you can see here, they continue. Oh, at this moment, we found a, a collision. So this is uh, what we call a lambda collision. The T1 and T2 are the foot lengths of the lambda. Again, they are fixed. And this allows us, in a similar way, to also bound the collision probability with these two fixed uh, values of T1 and T2. But we could actually continue, um, because it's going to be interesting as soon as, not now but later, we will look at iterated random functions, that we might not see this collision, but we might see a, a later one. Then here we can still find the collision, a second one, uh, which we call a lambda rho double collision use some imagination to see the picture here, where t1 and t2 are the foot lengths, uh, delta t is the intervening length, and again c is the cycle length. Again, all these parameters are ones that we will fix to bound a uh, probability of a uh, successful uh, collision attack. And actually, again, we will derive two bounds, one uh, with and one without the value of alpha that uh, will fix the uh, convenient value. Actually, there's a variety of this as well, because if you look at this construction, when you continue on for your next uh, collision, now it's getting back into the joint part of the two trails, but it could also go back to one of the two uh, feet of your lambda. So a different way of writing this would be this uh, picture. This is another way in which you could find uh, two collisions if you're starting with uh, two starting points, two trails. Uh, so this would be then what we call a row uh, prime double collision that we need to consider. There's actually another um, degenerate case as well where you have a threefold collision, uh, like going here, 
back into the main meeting point. So then you have three different inputs with the same uh, output. But that's also something we consider as a degenerate case of, uh, of one of the previous ones. So having explained a bit what the type of uh, things are that you can find as a collision attack uh, with one or two trails, now we are looking at iterated random functions. And we're going to look at what successful collision attacks are with m trails. So now you won't actually see all of the outputs because some of them will be internal. <coughs> So what happens is I'm jumping, let's say <laughs> r is equal to 2, I'm iterating twice. I'm jumping by two calls. So this um, dot that is not black is the one that you don't see going around. At this moment what will happen is, so I'm now going to do another call of 2 times f, and I'm only going to see the output. There has been a collision on the underlying function, but you cannot see it in the output, because that's not a value that you've, you've outputted. However, if you do continue around the cycle, then after going around once, you will find the collision on the iterated function. Uh, similarly, if you look at a two-trail attack, then let's say now we start from x2, we apply the function twice, so again choosing r equal to 2, now starting the trail from uh, x1, here again uh, x2, now from x1 I'm continuing, there has been a collision on the underlying uh, function, but you don't see it yet. However, if we continue now, so I'm now only going to look at the one that started from um, x2. Um, if I'm going around the cycle, then at this moment, I will find a collision with the other trail starting from the other point. Um, so these are the types of attacks that we need to <coughs> calculate bounds on to be used in the, the final proof. So here you see a uh, bound that we obtained for the single trail attack, then again for the two trail attack, and also uh, generalized, we can see that, because when you have a collision, um, that will mean that the two inputs that lead to the same output must be either coming from the same trail or must be coming from different trails. So there is a way of also taking an m trail in attack into account. So what would happen if an attacker would take m different starting points and bound what the uh, collision probability would be of this? Now, having done all these calculations of attacks, because as I said, this presentation is not about attacks, it's about proving a better security bound. Those are, however, the attacks <coughs> that we can use inside the proof that will get us the better uh, security bound. So now for the first time we will look at the advantage of an adversary to distinguish a random function from an iterated random function, so at bounds, not at attacks. And we're going to look at how to construct, um, uh, how to construct this bound. Uh, so again, what we're going to do is apply the H coefficient technique. Here we choose the real oracle to be the iterated random function and the ideal oracle will be a random function. We want to distinguish in a black box way between these two. Um, and we dis define our good transcripts as transcripts that must satisfy two properties. One property is that all outputs are distinct. Now this will mean intuitively, I mean we worked this out more in detail in the paper, that there would not have been some successful m-trail attack present somewhere. Because clearly, if that's the case, then you don't have all outputs distinct. You've somehow found a, a collision. Uh, and also that there are no permutation cycles. So permutation cycle means that um, when you are going to start from a certain trail, that you end up to the starting point again, that you have a cycle going back to the initial point. Uh, so these two things must be satisfied to not have uh, to have a good transcript. Uh, so let's see what that means in practice. Here we have some transcript that we found with um, and starting points, and we start. Oh, here. Uh, at this moment, we see that we have a collision. So this is not a good transcript. Uh, let's look at another one. So at this moment, this is a permutation cycle. So that's again something we consider to be a bad transcript. So we'll get another transcript. Uh, 
In this case, this is this lambda situation that we have two trails merging. So again, a collision, so a bad transcript. What a good transcript will look like is, for example, this one. So basically, a set of lines with a certain number of starting points. Uh, interestingly, um, this is something that will um, define an isomorphism of transcripts when you have these um, lines that don't have any cycle or any collision between the transcripts in the ideal world and the real world. And that's a crucial thing to actually get the, uh, proven to see the, the generality of the result. Um, so then let's apply the H coefficient technique. So again, here I give the lemma of the H coefficient technique that we applied to PRP pair F and we're now going to apply to uh, iterated random function. In this, um, the bounds, the epsilon 1, the epsilon 2 that we derive, we have this m trail attack term that we uh, derived earlier. But also, as I said, a good um, transcript is one that doesn't have a permutation uh, cycle. So this is something that we also uh, need to, to take into account. So you see another uh, term uh, appearing. Um, for epsilon 2, as you can see in the term, there's no R present for the number of iterations, which makes sense because in the ideal world, we have a random function, not an iterated random function. So then um, this allows us to bound the uh, adversary as, as follows. So to conclude the talk, what we do is we look at the iterated random function problem, which means that it, let's say that f is a random function. We want to distinguish between f and f iterated r times. Then the best known attack is an attack that is uh, at the bound that has but the, the best known attack is linear in uh, R if we want to look at the success probability. But for the advantage of the best known bound, there is a quadratic term. So what we do is we improve this to an almost linear term. So we still have this logarithmic factor. That's, of course, an interesting thing for uh, future work <coughs> to um, But it's slower, I mean, it grows slower than any uh, polynomial function, thereby showing that we have an almost tight result um, the, between the best known attack and the best known bound. So this, includes my, this, this concludes my talk. I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. So do we have questions? Uh, I have a small puzzle. Because the tag is for a now adaptive, and your bound is for a adaptive adversary. So I, I'm not sure if I understood your question. So the best known attack is, for is a, a non adaptive attack. Yes. Uh, but the bound, bound that we improve takes adaptive adversaries into account. Yes. Uh, so I think it is a little counterintuitive. Because your bound implies that the long adaptive attack may be equal to the adaptive test. So um, what, what I should make clear is that we are not saying that um, non-adaptive attack is always going to be as good as an adaptive attack. It really depends on the way you choose the values of R and Q. And I'd invite everybody to look at the paper to see the exact bounds, to know um, what exactly the advantages that we are looking at. However, um, to give them basic motivation, like teaser in the beginning of the paper of what we want to do, if we are going to look at a small number of queries, and we're going to look at what the success probability is of uh, the attack, then <coughs> what we see is that there non-adaptive attacks, so just taking a set of inputs and looking at a collision at the output, <coughs> is the best attack with a certain, like this, this logarithmic factor still in there, because if we would be able to improve the attack, we would violate the best known bound. And the best known bound is adaptive, so of course it takes non-adaptive adversaries into account as well. Yes, I believe. Yes, I, I'm really not sure yes, if I'm answering your question. I just asked puzzle because I believe your proof is right. And okay, my, but my yeah. puzzle is that a, a, a non adaptive attack maybe is equivalent to the adaptive attack because your bound uh, is the upper bound. 
advantage. I think he's just saying adaptivity doesn't help. Yes, the, the adaptivity doesn't help. Yes. And I'm saying adaptivity can help, but it really depends on how you choose the values of R and Q. So the result is actually much more than what I'm showing in this presentation. You will see the full formula in the paper where you can see that in specific cases it does help to be uh, adaptive. But this is for, for example, large values of Q and R. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's, if you look at a very small number of queries, like what I showed in the beginning of the presentation, then adaptivity does not help. Yeah, it, it's more subtle than this, yeah. Any other questions? Right. But do you think adaptivity could help to get the log tree uh, cube there? Could you improve the attack to get the log tree cube in there? That, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a really, that's a really good question. So um, the factor log r that comes in there um, comes from a specific theorem that we need that um, is related to the distribution of prime numbers because that's somehow important and uh, it's, it's something that uh, we may be able to, to get rid of, um, but it's, not, right? it's, it's not clear. Um, so we, we wanted to make sure, like if you make small steps in the wrong direction um, in this uh, security proof, you have to be really careful, then you end up with the trivial CBC back mount and you didn't end up with anything that is improved over uh, uh, what is known already. So we were really careful to avoid this, but did still end up with this log R factor, and that's something that um, is, is not really clear if it is a necessary factor or not. So, but it comes from this prime thing. Uh, yeah. Which yeah. you can improve with. So how but do the primes yeah. come into the picture? Yeah, well, yeah, so there is a, <laughs> there is a certain uh, small lemma that we needed, okay. uh, for which first we found the result that is uh, conditional based on the Riemann oh, zeta hypothesis, but then I thought, oh no, that's never going to fly because the reviewers will say, and I would say myself, what is this Riemann zeta hypothesis? I don't understand it. Should I assume that it is true? So we found another type of result that was proven that we need somewhere in the computation that is unconditional, um, but it does have this log r factor in there. It's related to when you see yourself going around the cycle, you need to go around a certain number of times. The greatest common divisor is important to know how many times. So the uh, greatest common divisor between r and the cycle length is important, and that's where these prime numbers and eventually the log factor uh, comes in. OK, let's perhaps take uh, further discussions offline into the coffee break, and let's thank the speaker again.